Okay, sorry, uh, but we're back. Um, so again, my name is Lawrence Camp. I want to thank everybody for participating in this webinar. Uh, as I started to say, Santiago and I are really pumped up and excited about uh, the ability to address this topic with you. Uh, we are agreed that we want to keep this presentation short and to the point so that we will have a lot of time uh, for questions and discussion. I uh, just want to note for those of you who are not uh, that knowledgeable about Market Links and the many things it offers, including a series of webinars, of which this is a one. It's a terrific platform uh, funded by USAID uh, for development practitioners interested in markets and in the role of markets in development. And hope that you will become a frequent visitor uh, to this community. <clears throat> With that, uh, let me introduce the presenters. I'm Lawrence Camp, and I'm with USAID and the Office of Private Capital Microenterprise. My focus, uh, my area of focus is finance and development. I have about 25 years of experience in development uh, within USAID, Millennium Challenge Corporation, and as an implementing partner running the financial sector development project in West Bank and Gaza. Prior to that, I was in the financial services industry. Uh, in commercial banking and structured finance as Vice President of Security Pacific Merchant Bank in New York. And with me is my co-presenter, Santiago Sadaka from Palladium. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you all. Um, well, I'm a bit of an accidental executive. I work at Palladium and I manage our economic growth and governance practice as well as our New York-based commercial innovation team. Um, where we work with donors and governments and corporations worldwide in um, ways in which we can achieve what we call positive impact around the world. Um, for the donor audience, I've been working on private sector development for about 25 years as well and um, have been lately spending a lot of time working on blended finance and pay for results uh, solutions. So, how did the concept that drives um, the investment mobilization platform arise? It actually comes out of structured finance, which is a subset of finance dealing with leverage and risk with its intent to provide debt financing for riskier transactions at the lowest possible cost, usually through some sort of credit enhancement <coughs> like a guarantee or a first loss or layering in equity or subordinated debt, or in this case, blended finance. Uh, so DCA is actually a form of structured finance. In short, it's the art of arranging financing for risky transactions at the lowest possible cost of capital. This can get a little complicated, and those, uh, for those of you uh, within USAID who are interested, you may uh, want to take our Mobilizing Finance for Development course, or for others, uh, you might want to download the Comprehensive Introduction to Mobilizing Finance for Development, which can be found on the Office of Private Capital site on the USAID website, or we have it below, uh, I believe, in the, in the links site uh, on this, in this webinar. So from a development perspective, the challenge we are facing is how do you get financial transactions completed which have strong economic and social benefits but may be slightly low in terms of the required financial return and which otherwise would not happen? And the answer is uh, you make uh, these transactions more attractive by lowering transaction costs and or increasing the return to those providing the finance. So just to step back a bit, why does finance matter? Simple answer, accomplishing our development objectives, whether it's health, <coughs> agriculture, wash, or economic growth broadly, requires productivity improvement and modernization. And modern, uh, which in turn requires investment or capital expenditure. Investments in things such as plants, uh, plants and equipment, technology, education, and human capital development. And this requires financing 
uh, since those investments usually take several years to pay for their costs. So mobilizing investment at scale is kind of the holy grail for development practitioners. And um, I think we're speaking to an audience, judging from the participants, um, that understands the importance of investment. Whether from a macro or microeconomic perspective, we know that there is no development without investment. Now, we believe that there's no lack of capital sloshing around the world. The challenge, as Lawrence was alluding to, is to incentivize capital to address the development opportunities that mitigate the development challenges we're all working on. One of the classic cases is agriculture. Lawrence mentioned a few others. Uh, but in agriculture, the investment gap just in Sub-Saharan Africa is in the tens of billions of dollars, both for operating and capital expenditures. Now, this platform approach takes this challenge head on. It takes a comprehensive and focused look at how to facilitate capital going into specific development opportunities using a variety of demand side and supply side tools that we're going to talk about that address an immediate need. Now, we also hope to leave behind a system after a program ends that better connects financial institutions with capital users, BDS providers, and other stakeholders who can then all work together on a commercial basis. So, what is the investment mobilization platform? Essentially, it is a single hub or point which engages across the entire transaction ecosystem to identify, structure, and close transactions with the ability to use the secret sauce of blended finance when needed. What is blended finance? <clears throat> Very simply, using lower cost public funds to encourage the higher cost private funds for transactions which have development importance. So the elements in there that are important to think about in the investment mobilization platform, it's market driven, it seeks to nudge the market along by bringing the suppliers of financing together with those seeking financing in a way that reduces the, the friction or in economic and finance terms, reduces the transaction costs. It engages local actors as business advisory services providers or transaction advisors to identify and tee up potential transactions. It harnesses paper results to both originate and close transactions with business advisory services providers paid primarily on a success fee basis and banks and other finance providers paid only when financing is dispersed. It uses blended capital to increase the yield on transaction or reduce risk premiums or offset risk premiums. Uh, for transactions would have strong economic returns and important to uh, the USAID, but maybe slightly short in terms of the financial returns. It maximizes leverage. Uh, we are targeting uh, for every $1 of our public funds uh, at least 20, 30, are 40 times more in private funds. And sustainability. Hopefully, uh, Santiago said, we are changing the ecosystem. And certainly in Ghana, uh, we're successful in building up a cadre of local BAS providers that are now operating independently. And even without incentives, banks are continuing to lend. What's the problem uh, the platform is solving, and how does it do it? As Santiago noted, uh, the developing world is actually a wash in capital. McKinsey estimated the financial assets in emerging markets are expected to surge from about $40 trillion in 2010 to $111 trillion in 2020, meaning that most of our presence countries, there is abundant capital. There is abundant capital, and that is abundant domestic capital as well, which has preferences in terms of avoiding any potential exchange risk. So the capital is available in our present countries for their own development to be funded uh, if, again, that capital could be intermediated. And the problem is that not enough of those funds are going to finance investments in the areas that are important to us, health, agriculture, et cetera. 
We won't go into that in this webinar in any detail as to why that's the, the case, but the general problem is, of course, that the financial systems are less developed and the risks, uh, both perceived and actual, uh, are higher. In that effect, this raises the cost of capital for finance providers and sometimes to a level which is higher than the investment can sustain. In our Mobilizing Capital for Investment course, we use the example of Teo's tractors in Ghana as compared to Mary's tractors in Iowa. Uh, both of them um, with projected revenues uh, and cash flows exactly the same. Both seeking to uh, expand their tractor servicing businesses, which will have enormous economic benefits uh, in terms of productivity improvement. But the bottom line is that Mary in Iowa gets the and Iowa gets financing, while Teo in Ghana does not simply because of the higher cost of capital which prevails in Ghana. So how does uh, the investment mobilization platform solve this problem? First, it crowds in potential transactions. It produces a pipeline of potential financing opportunities which lowers the cost for finance providers. In banking, a major cost factor is simply the cost of identifying uh, originating new loans and new borrowers. Second, it crowds in finance providers. With the promise of a steady pipeline of deals, the platform attracts finance providers, banks, investors, and others, creating competition for a transaction. And third, if and as needed, the ability to draw upon a blended finance facility to provide de-risking and or to, to sweeten yields, to bump the, uh, the yield that the finance provider is going to get. So let us turn to our old uh, friend, uh, the country of prosperity that we are uh, prosperity that we're all familiar with, a country which in many respects is similar to the countries that USAID works in. The prosperity uh, mission is focused on improving uh, agriculture, um, and uh, is trying to modernize the agriculture, wash, and uh, power supply chains, which is going to require significant investment far beyond what the government of Prosperia and USAID and other donors can provide. So they absolutely need to access this private, uh, this private capital, this capital that is seeking commercial returns. Good news, there's a lot of money available uh, out there. So liquidity or the, the amount of capital present in Prosperia is not a problem. The bad news, there are simply not enough actionable deals, uh, loan requests or financial requests with the information needed to make a finance decision. And in general, uh, the financial requests that are presented are simply not that attractive to the finance providers. Uh, again, problem is the high transaction costs and the risks associated with these transactions. Um, for you, those of you in uh, USAID missions, uh, this probably sounds familiar. So I want to turn to a pretty complex diagram here. Um, and I want to uh, just leave it up there for a little while and let you um, yeah, kind of work through it and, and, and get a uh, kind of a glimpse of what it's trying to do here. Uh, the intended result in Prosperia with this investment mobilization platform is to catalyze uh, $225 million in capital expenditures in areas critical to accomplishing uh, mission priorities. OK, so how is this going to happen? Well, first of all, the first step is to identify what investments are important to catalyze. And when we use the term investment, uh, I want to note that we're talking about a capital expenditure. So when a farmer uses a loan to buy irrigation pipe, he or she is making a capital expenditure or an investment. Uh, and we want to be very intentional about the investments that we're trying to catalyze. The mission is not interested, for example, in <coughs> catalyzing financing for fast food franchises. That's not one of its development objectives. 
No. It wanted farmers to be able to make investment in irrigation pipe and tractors. It wanted clean water tra uh, treatment sites and last mile water pipes. And it wanted clean energy, mini grids, and household solar systems. <clears throat> Those of you who know Prosperia know that uh, uh, there's no problem in getting power in the central cities, but out in the remote eastern part of the country, uh, there is no power connection. The mission wanted to make sure that uh, those uh, uh, mini grids and household systems were available. So it created a shopping list of things that it needed. Second, with this in hand, the next step is to build a transaction origination function to identify and tee up uh, um, potential uh, agriculture wash uh, and other related transactions. Operating on a largely success fee basis, the function will engage a network of business advisor service providers or transaction advisors to identify financing needs and sort development of actual financing proposals. Um, <coughs> So uh, the transaction advisors, the mission was more than happy to have as many transaction advisors uh, as, uh, as needed um, because <coughs> simply um, it was only going to pay uh, for those transaction advisors on completed transactions, not best efforts. So the mission is happy to engage as many qualified BAS providers as possible. Next, with that in hand, uh, the system, uh, the uh, uh, the platform built out a finance provider network to engage a broad array of finance providers to include domestic, foreign banks, diaspora, other investors, venture investment funds, and non-bank financial institutions. The intent is to build a deep uh, and broad spectrum uh, of finance providers, which is capable of covering uh, the full spectrum of financing needs. So the ability to offer a pipeline of transactions is attractive to these finance <coughs> investors uh, and helps uh, attract their interest in becoming part of the network. The next step, uh, three, um, or step four, is the, uh, the secret sauce, the catalytic facility. Now the catalytic facility uh, is used to pay success fees to BAS providers, business advisors providers, on completed transactions, as well as to provide incentive payments uh, or blended capital, if you will, to finance providers, if and as needed, to mitigate the higher risk premium which prevails in transactions. Uh, so again, this is intended to use for transactions that are really important to the mission for development purposes, have very strong economic returns, but because of a higher um, a cost of capital requirements uh, in Prosperia may not get the financing without a little bit of a nudge in terms of the, uh, the yield or, or the rate that they are offering to the finance providers. So the facility is intended to use again as a form of blended capital but used first sparingly and with not less than a 30 to 1 match on average. So uh, for every three dollars of public funds um, where the uh, mission expects to catalyze $30 worth of, uh, of private funds. So pulling this all together, uh, Prosperia has built a machine to originate, process, and execute transactions. In this case, again, the intent is to generate at least $225 million worth of capital investment in targeted sectors, an investment uh, which would otherwise not occur using the uh, $7.5 million worth of blended capital from the catalytic fund, again, to generate a leverage of about 30 to 1. Just want to quickly note the two boxes on the top left side, uh, two elements um, that uh, we would like Prosperity to include uh, in its in thinking is the ability for other funds. Once we built this machine, <coughs> this machine is capable of taking other funds from other donors, uh, philanthropic organizations, uh, because we have essentially a one-stop shop that can fill other uh, requirements, other development requirements, say in education or other areas. Second, uh, the advisory council, some sort of an advisory system that provides a feedback loop to policymakers so that they can understand uh, from the market actors what is constraining these transactions from happening uh, without a, uh, an additional level of support. 
Well, thank you, Lawrence. Um, I guess my charge is to talk about some specific places where we've been implementing these uh, these concepts. And I guess the core question, if I were listening, uh, that I would have is, does this approach work? And I think that a good, clear example is the recently concluded Financing Ghanaian Agriculture Program, a Feed the Future program that sought to facilitate financing into maize, soy, and rice um, in northern Ghana. Now, when the program was first designed in 2011, 2012, no one was really investing in northern Ghana. Uh, but we know that without financing, as we were saying early, um, there's not going to be any improvement in production or livelihood, which is the goal of the future programs at large um, in what the country so desperately was needing at the time, and still does to a great degree. It was a time in which interest rates were at 24% per year. So no banks were interested in financing relatively risky ag projects when they could just buy government bonds instead and make money that way. However, taking both a demand side and supply side approach, we were able to incentivize BDS to identify good agriculture projects and make them bankable, incentivize financial institutions to make loans or make equity investments. We used other risk mitigation tools to help place capital. We helped financial institutions develop specific lending products to reach specific target populations. We served as an ongoing convener of all system stakeholders, facilitating their work together. And uh, we left behind a network of actors that now work together on a commercial basis. A classic case of a, a success case was what happened with Barclays Bank, which went from having a portfolio in agriculture of about $400,000 when we started and really not expressing a lot of interest in getting involved in the program to having a 50 million portfolio in agriculture. And now the Ghanaian office serving as a bit of an um, advisor to other country offices around Sub-Saharan Africa. So let's drill down on the results achieved. Well, we worked on um, a number of things, but primarily worked with 50 uh, financial institutions and 22 business advisory service providers. And I want to make a comment here. I use the terms BAS and BDS, business advisory service providers and business development service providers, or sometimes consulting firms interchangeably. So please excuse that. Um, uh, but I think that, uh, that that's important to bear in mind. We're talking about consulting firms. So. These organizations, uh, working through these organizations, the program helped facilitate $168 million in financing. We more than doubled the project objectives, which seemed rather high when we were starting out in the beginning. We have impact studies in how many, in which ways, people were affected by the program, including women, small traders, a number of other uh, specific target groups. In terms of dollars, much of the financing went into middle of the value chain actors, such as agriculture processors and logistics providers, which was the primary um, target group for the program. But a lot of resources also were mobilized to finance input dealers and small and larger traders, as you can see. Now, we are embarking in a new adventure in Kenya, where the system is more sophisticated, but where significant financing still needs to happen. And we think that this approach is going to bear good fruit in Kenya. The Kenya Investment Mechanism is a five-year program funded by USAID, uh, part of its suite of Feed the Future uh, activities. Um, it's focusing on the clean energy, horticulture, livestock, and dairy value chains, 
and is designed to unlock financing for the other Feed the Future programs in Kenya. The objective is obviously to um, unlock $400 million in financing but ultimately, we want to build a market system that mobilizes this capital for Kenya um, over the long term and leave a commercial um, sound system after the life of the program. I'm going to skip this slide and move over to the next one. Um, and before we get into talking about this seemingly complicated slide, I want to talk a little bit about what it takes to put together a good investment uh, platform. Um, and essentially, I'm talking about a number of assessments that we conduct before we uh, design what needs to happen, understand what we have to work with, and figure out the sort of incentive structures that we want to put in place. First of all, we conduct demand assessments. Uh, we talk to investors and ask them what sorts of projects are in their pipelines. How much funding do they need? Why are they being funded or why are they not being funded? And what are the principal challenges in obtaining financing? We talk to financing institutions, FIs. Um, and here we will talk to banks, we'll talk to equity funds, any kind of equity fund from uh, uh, very uh, hardcore equity funds to impact funds and everything in between. We'll talk to microfinance institutions. And the questions that we'll ask them are, who are they financing? What are the financing gaps that they see? Are they working with consulting firms? Um, are there policy constraints that they're dealing with? In Kenya, for instance, right now, there's an interest rate cap, which is um, creating some difficulties in, uh, uh, in financing projects. Are there tools like DCA or other tools to help mitigate risk and risk perception? And, of course, we'll also do uh, assessments of the BAS market or the consulting market. We'll Ask how many consulting firms exist. Who are they targeting as customers? How much are they charging? So based on our sense of the quality of the ecosystem that exists in country, then we design a program and a team according to what we find. So looking at this slide, we are overlaying essentially the activities with our partners and how we construct our team with how the program works. On the left-hand column, up top, we start with the team that works on the demand side, led by our DCOP in this case. When you look further down, we talk about the investment team. That is the team that works on the supply side. Um, in, in this case, it is uh, led by the COP. And we do a variety of things. Um, within that, um, within within the team, obviously, uh, but principally, if you look at the bottom of the slide, this the first step is to identify investments in strategic partnerships. The second step is to provide transaction assistance. The third step is to put together the incent incentive schemes for financial institutions to invest. The fourth step is to layer on risk mitigation tools that might exist. Step five is to remove barriers to investment, as Lawrence was alluding to earlier. Um, when we have this type of a presence in a country, we have a lot of convening power. and We have a lot of ability to talk to policymakers and say, hey, this is what's causing certain frictions in the financial markets. And these are some ways in which you might be able to address them. And finally, step six is to close investments. So let me go through the core of what we do more closely. On the demand side, we identify BAS that could met, uh, package projects and incentivize them 
to work with companies that need the financing. The way in which we principally do this is by providing them an incentive, in most cases of a few thousand dollars, for every loan or equity investment that they help facilitate. Currently, we now have about 50 consulting firms or BAS providers. Most of the consulting fees are paid, of course, by the beneficiary firms receiving the consulting services. Over the life of the program, these project incentives get reduced. Our role as Kim is to make sure that there are enough BAS providers that can produce enough pipeline of projects and that they develop ongoing <coughs> relationships with financial institutions, both banks and equity partners, as well as MFIs and other financial institutions that may be in the country. So moving over to the supply side, we put out a competitive RFP where we invite banks and other financial institutions to participate in the program. While we give them a parameter for what sorts of incentives we might be willing to provide, generally in the order of 100 basis points or so, these organizations compete to get them into, or we make them compete to get them into the program. So it helps us determine what good incentives might be. We don't want to over-incentivize uh, financial institutions to participate. Um, we pay the financial institutions when they disperse the loans for equity. Of course, financial institutions are investing from their own resources, not from uh, USAID or other donor resources. As appropriate, we might help FIs identify risk mitigation tools such as DCA. In Kenya, for instance, there's a large portfolio of DCA guarantees that we are helping financial institutions learn how to use a little bit better. And we provide training on an as-needed basis. The typical thing for any of these programs to do is if a bank is trying to develop a new product or to enter into a market where we are interested in them entering. So essentially, this is how these programs work in two uh, pretty significant countries in the USAID uh, family of programs. Now, you may be wondering, can this work in my country? Well, the reality is that this approach grew organically out of a number of projects <coughs> that we implemented, uh, oftentimes with USAID over the years. In each case, and here I'm referring to Colombia, Macedonia, Ecuador, and the West Africa uh, experiences, we hired local consultants to incentivize pipeline development, loan application preparation, and deer closure. In Colombia, was the first place where we uh, understood the need to work on application preparation and deal closure to help companies that we were already helping through other technical assistance. In Macedonia, a few years later, was the first place where we experimented with incentivizing consultants. In Ecuador and Nicaragua, we put a little bit more um, we put a little more science around these schemes. We formalized what sorts of ratios we were looking for. We formalized training to bass and so on. And uh, a few years later, in the West Africa Trade Hub experience, we showed that these schemes could work in Africa. It wasn't until FinGap came, though, that we started working on the supply side incentives, as we've been discussing um, over the last few minutes. One of our colleagues, Amanda Fernandez at Palladium, wrote a nice paper comparing the Macedonia, Ecuador, and West Africa Trade Hub experiences. We'll make that available uh, over email or some sort of link after, the, after this presentation. So this is a little bit about our experiences. Over to you, Lawrence. Okay, so uh, again, you've seen this uh, chart in a similar form before. Um, we don't need to go through it. I'd say what uh, Santiago said, uh, much of this has uh, been done before in other ways and forms. I think what's different about this approach is it does really combine, A, it combines all of the elements in one uh, single shop hub uh, to uh, based on the supply and demand side of financing and it incorporates uh, blended capital. So um, with that, uh, 
top takeaways. So if those listening have not had a ton of concerns and questions uh, and uh, um, about this, we have probably uh, done something wrong here. Because there are a lot of challenges with this approach. It's not simple. Um, if you want a, a simpler approach, uh, this is not it. Uh, but we think it has, again, huge potential for impact. Some of the things one needs to think about. Assuring additionality. And additionality, of course, means uh, that uh, only transactions that would otherwise get done are not going to get done. <clears throat> For example, in Haiti, uh, where there are uh, agricultural investment requirements, uh, there's no point in us uh, supporting transactions which are going to get done through the market. So I'd say uh, that we don't want the AAA transactions, nor do we want the, uh, the, the, the really bad transactions. What we're after are kind of the transactions that are close but not quite uh, uh, at uh, a point at which the market will clear through the market without some support. Maximizing leverage or conversely minimizing subsidy. Um, again, Prosperia, the mission has a limited amount of money. Uh, that money needs to go as far as it can. And from a taxpayer's perspective, this is public funds, taxpayer funds. We are obligated to make sure we're getting as much leverage as possible. Minimizing distortion. Kenya has a strong and vibrant uh, financial sector. The last thing that we want to do uh, with the platform is to go in and undercut uh, the, uh, the financial services industry in Ghana, which is why we will work with any and all comers, again, working only on transactions that are otherwise not going to clear through the market. One of the challenges uh, inherent in this, and really challenging, is setting and pricing incentives. And uh, I will say in the Kenya, the Kim project, uh, really, um, pay for results has been embedded throughout the project. <clears throat> Not only pay for results in terms of identifying transactions, teeing them up, and closing transactions, but also with the implementer. Uh, they have accepted, uh, again, a pay for results award fee, a significant award fee, uh, based upon their performance. Now, I can tell you that setting and pricing metrics is very complicated. Uh, we have just completed a, a concept note with a firm called Firm Capital on pricing and setting metrics that we'd be happy to share with you if interested. Finally, adaptive management. Certainly, um, we knew in uh, Ghana that uh, whatever the situation was, or we thought the situation was on day one, um, it was certainly going to be turn out to be differently than what uh, we had assumed. And um, once we had figured out what that situation was six months hence, things were going to change. So it's necessary to be able to be flexible in terms of the, uh, the award um, uh, and the design of the project, which is challenging, particularly when you're using pay for results. Santiago. So, how do we deal with all these um, challenges? Well, I think that there's some success factors to consider. Um, by now, uh, thankfully, we've done it for a few years. And the first one is that you really need to have a, a good sense of the local context. Uh, the local context helps the structure and the pricing of the system. The more sophisticated the context, the more impact you might be able to have in terms of leverage. And here there's a little bit of art and there's a little bit of science. Second, it is necessary to do this in a mission where you can have a little bit of leeway as an implementing partner to make decisions. There's a bazillion decisions that get made in terms of incentives, how to structure them, who you work with, and uh, you need to have a good level of trust between the mission, the implementing partner, or the team in general. Third, on M&E, um, we build the M&E into the subcontracts or subgrants that we um, issue with FIs and uh, consulting firms. So we know well uh, where we're, uh, how well we're doing in achieving our targets. In terms of CLA, um, by definition, the program requires continuous tinkering and tweaks. Um, as I was uh, initially alluding to, uh, 
Uh, there are rounds of um, RFPs that we put out, and um, each year um, these RFPs uh, get tweaked on just to be able to lower the amount of incentives that we put into the market. Number five, you want to have sufficient budget. Ideally, you have enough money so you can get the synergies of working on both the supply and the demand side. But of course, you can use elements of these programs into uh, some of your private sector development programs or other programs that you may be managing um, and, um, and, and overlay them. Right now, that's what we're doing in El Salvador and Guatemala, where we didn't start out with a uh, investment platform, but we are using uh, a number of these elements in, um, in uh, achieving uh, some of the results that we're wanting to, uh, to achieve over there. A couple more. Pur purposeful structuring of PFR incentives. What do I mean by that? Essentially, we <coughs> need to understand something about the area that you're targeting for investment facilitation. Um, and finally, it goes without saying that the role of the implementing partner is to make sure that services are of high quality, that provide additionality, and generally we're working with people that um, we want to be associated with. Those are my uh, top uh, success factors. There's a lot more that we can discuss, and I'm looking forward to our time for questions and uh, hopefully some answers on our part. Right. So questions. So we have a number of questions, and we are really looking forward to uh, uh, other questions. Um, we really like harder questions, like uh, why are you uh, giving away free money, and uh, you know what's the sustainability of this? Because uh, we've tried to think through all of these issues, but certainly want to hear um, the challenging questions that you have. So let's just go through uh, what we have. We have. Uh, let's see. First question. From Indra, uh, what percent of the program participants obtain insurance? To what degree has this lowered the cost of financing? Um, I guess the answer I would say in that is certainly uh, if you're going to get insurance, that's a form, if you will, of, of risk mitigation, of structured finance. Um, I would say uh, that's an interesting question, and I'd say that for the BAS providers, um, however they feel they can kind of most effectively bring this transaction to close is up to them. Um, again, someone needs to pay for insurance. Uh, the metric that we're primarily looking at is what is the fewest number of dollars that we need uh, to get the transaction across the finish line. Santiago? Yeah, it varies. Um, so in, um, in Ghana and Kenya, the insurance markets are different. Uh, by and large, um, insurance is one of the products that um, might get paid for, uh, mostly on the commercial loan side, of course. Um, I would say that the preponderance of the transactions that we facilitate do not have insurance as part of their scheme. Okay, we've got a question um, or comment, uh, really, from Dick Tinsley. Appreciate the tractor example. One problem is the same tractor in Ghana is only one-fourth as efficient in Iowa. Uh, agree with that. This is an illustrative uh, example, of course. Um, I think the point uh, that we were simply making, uh, and it does point, Frank, to, to the point that uh, farming is, if you will, less efficient than, um, you know, with a two-hectare farm versus a uh, thousand-acre farm in, uh, in Iowa. Uh, but nonetheless, really, uh, the revenues are the same, the operating projections are the same, the cash flows are expected to be exactly the same. The point is that Simply because the higher cost of capital in Iowa, um, the uh, Teos tractors in in Ghana, the, sorry, the higher cost of capital in Ghana, Teos tractors is not going to get uh, financing. Um, uh, so uh, from Adam um, Tomasek, what level of formality is recommended in building out the finance network? Are there statements of interest or other forms of official declarations? Um, I just one thing and return over to Santiago. Uh, I think our view is um, again we want as many finance providers who want to come to the table. They only have uh, kind of one metric: have you dispersed the financing or not? Uh, so that's basically the bottom line. I think they want some sort of a surety that if they do uh, disperse the financing for targeted transactions. They're going to get paid. 
but I'd say uh, make it as, <coughs> as easy and simple uh, uh, as, as possible. Yeah, well, that's the principle. The reality is that if they're going to receive USAID funding, they need to go through a bit of a vetting process. So uh, when we put out RFPs, uh, these financial institutions um, essentially are telling us what they're going to do with this money and how much incentive do they need and how much money they think they're going to disperse. Through that process, we try to make it as simple as possible because these are not your typical uh, USAID uh, grantees or contractors, um, but they give us a fair amount of paperwork. Uh, we try to have it streamlined as, uh, as much as possible. Uh, as Lauren says, we don't want to put too much of a cap on how many financial institutions um, we are going to be working with. And one of the fun things about uh, these programs is you never know which are the financial institutions that are going to take off. Um, in Ghana, I did, uh, I was part of the assessment of uh, figuring out which FIs were, we were going to work with in the beginning. And the ones that ended up uh, working out the best and getting most involved were different. Uh, Barclays Bank wanted nothing to do with agriculture financing when we first started. And the fact that we put this shiny object in front of them, uh, which frankly from a bank like Barclays, you know, 100 basis points to be able to uh, conduct a transaction, that's not a lot of money. But it kind of captured their attention in saying, wow, there's something here, maybe we should take a look at it. And uh, they were a great partner for our program. Um, some uh, impact funds were very good partners. Some microfinance institutions are very good partners for our programs. Uh, there's a question later on about being able to work with uh, people um, in uh, different uh, points in the value chain. And microfinance institutions were capitalized. Um, microfinance institutions help um, uh, finance tractors and some smaller um, mechanization um, uh, as well as uh, trading. So essentially, um, we want to keep it open, but there is a process that they need to go through. So we have from Mark, uh, how are the outcomes, milestones, structured through the catalytic facility? How is this agreed upon and how does this approach allow for adaptability, flexibility, so capital and priority development sectors is catalyzed? That's a very, very good question. Um, I'd say on the uh, for finance providers, the metric is pretty simple. Um, uh, was there a commitment of funds would be one metric one could pay up on, uh, but even more importantly, was there a disbursement of funds? Uh, so that is pretty cut and dried. In terms of finance providers, um, it's really not in the ability of most, uh, sorry, in terms of the BAS providers, <coughs> in terms of the BAS providers, um, not all of them are willing or capable of being able to take on all the risk of, uh, of hoping that they will work on transactions which may or may not um, conclude. So I think the general best practice is to arrange some sort of a, uh, a payment structure uh, based upon uh, milestones in terms of the transaction, but certainly with the, the bulk, the majority of the payment to them uh, be made um, on a success fee basis once the transaction is done. And I know that uh, one of the observations here is that, uh, no, this is never going to happen. Uh, these uh, BAS providers are not going to operate on that. Well, um, I think uh, Santiago can talk about uh, that may have been the first reaction from them because, frankly, they were in a pretty advantageous position where they were paid a lot just for best efforts going out and trying uh, and saying, gee, we tried hard but didn't get it done. But once um, you change the games of the rule, uh, you got more BAS providers and they were willing to, uh, to respond. Absolutely. So the, the West Africa Trade Hub experience early on was, was very interesting. We, we figured out that essentially we were overpaying for uh, business advisory services just to provide uh, a business plan for um, SMEs and, and other corporates 
and uh, we weren't paying enough on actual acceptance of an application and actual disbursement. And we started moving in, into the disbursement side of things, and, um, and things changed. Interestingly enough, the BAS providers that we ended up working with also changed. Um, and so we got less of the subsidy seekers and much more of those people who were really seeing in this an opportunity to develop a business for the long term. <coughs> so um, uh, another one from Indra. Uh, uh, can you provide data on the ratio of finance provided to male versus uh, female versus male applicants? Um, uh, Santiago, I think I you have a careful good case, measure. Yeah, I have a good case study in uh, from Finga, and uh, my email is somewhere in there. And I'd love to, uh, if you shoot me an email, I'd love to send that to you. It wasn't one of the things that we were uh, tasked to do, but we were uh, interested in um, in doing a uh, an assessment of that uh, as the program was coming along. One of the neatest experiences I had was going into a market in northern uh, Ghana and talking to a female trader who used to get loans from a local microfinance institution at 75% APR. And once these microfinance institutions started working with our program and started getting better capitalized, the loans that uh, these female traders were getting uh, came down to uh, the 35, 38% range. You might think that's still very expensive, but uh, that is life changing for a small women trader uh, in a market in, in northern Ghana. So we certainly have uh, good stories to tell there, and, and systemic impact that we can that we can talk about. So Indra, would you elaborate on who the players are uh, in the financial arena? Any input from IFC? Uh, and if so, how this helps leverage costs for applicants. Well, the players, um, the, the goal here, uh, the, the premise is that there are, in our presence countries, uh, vibrant financial uh, services, uh, banks and others who are capable of intermediating financing. If they are not doing that to the sectors we like, it's not because they don't know how to or they're not there, it's because they have made a choice uh, that the, uh, the transaction costs and risks uh, make it not uh, attractive for them. So I think our assumption is we want to work with the market actors themselves. Uh, we understand that because it is more challenging in Ghana than in Iowa to, to extend this financing, we want to help the market along by nudging it, um, uh, A, by increasing the level of transactions available and doing all of that sort of preparatory work uh, so that we reduce the transaction costs and be, if and as needed, um, being able to sweeten the yield uh, or the return uh, for finance providers. Um, Santiago? I see a question here from Peter Boone, uh, which essentially is asking us to summarize the differences between catalyzing equity capital versus debt capital, and uh, which form of capital tends to bring more or better results. Uh, here's a a long uh, dissertation on equity versus uh, debt, but I'm going to summarize by saying that um, it depends. Um, coming back to my theme that uh, the, the system and the business environment that you're in um, is probably going to help uh, develop the program that you're going to have. So in Kenya, to be very specific, there are over a hundred equity funds, and we hope to work with them. Uh, in helping um, place um, some of the capital that currently, frankly, they're not placing. They're placing about 0.6 deals they, per year, each fund. Uh, and we think that this program can work with them. Does it take more time to, uh, to work on the equity side versus on the uh, debt side? Yeah, it, it generally does. And that is where you, some of the art comes into play, as long as with the science of market clearing. Um, essentially what we try to do is um, let, as, as we are receiving applications from uh, equity players, we're asking them what they would do with uh, the incentives. And um, 
by and large, we try not to pick a specific type of uh, uh, winner. Uh, <laughs> we let the market uh, kind of bear itself uh, out. Okay, I would say also uh, enterprises, countries. Debt is by far the uh, the largest player. Debt is is you know ninety eight percent of the finance ecosystem, and equity is only two percent. So I think uh, really it makes sense. Most uh, people seeking financing want debt because uh, basically the cost is cheaper and there are less uh, controls in there. So I, I, I certainly equity is harder to catalyze, no question. But debt is can basically provide the financing for investment, uh, I'd say, much more efficiently in our present countries. I think Lawrence is a former banker, and that's why he's giving you that answer. <laughs> yeah, that's my, that is my preference. Um, uh, from uh, Dick Tinsley, how much of your financing was individual smallholder farmers versus producers? I know that uh, that information is in uh, what you provided. Certainly, they did a fair amount of backward uh, uh, financing uh, through producers' organizations and uh, Santiago, anything yeah, by and large, we're, we're working with uh, MFIs and we're working with banks and, and, uh, and equity funds. Uh, they are not, so the people that we deal with are aggregators, financial aggregators. Um, we did find that on many cases, uh, particularly MFIs in northern Ghana, they were providing loans to uh, small producers. And so um, I talked about the number of small producers who were impacted in in, uh, in, uh, in the FinGap program, which is, uh, I believe, 170,000 or so. Um, so um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, you have a lot of questions here. Uh, information, I know from Brian, uh, is there information in Macedonia experience which would be helpful? Reach out to, to the Ukraine contacts, uh, reach out to um, uh, um, Santiago. Yeah, Macedonia, very interestingly, uh, it was an experience that the e, e Bureau really liked. And we actually um, had the Macedonia team go and visit uh, missions in Kosovo, in Bosnia, in Georgia, in pr uh, programs, uh, most of which, all of which were implemented by other implementing partners. Uh, took elements of our pay for performance system and included them into their own programs. Um, I believe we have, we, I think, uh, I want to promise that we have some case studies on that specific to Macedonia. You'll also have information on that one uh, report that I was telling you comparing the Macedonia experience to um, a couple other countries. Uh, so, from Andrew, what role can or should host country governments play in these platforms? Um, I, well, I'm always happy to have host governments observing and uh, hopefully learning lessons uh, that they can apply to policies. But this is really within the uh, within the um, uh, the market actors themselves. One of the things that happened in Ghana is um, people got really excited about what was going on, and uh, the government helped co-host uh, what we called an investment forum um, uh, that happened annually, and which is, I believe, I might be corrected by my colleagues in the uh, Ghana mission, but I believe it's still going on. Um, and uh, this was a very powerful um, tool that convene the users of capital, meaning SMEs and larger enterprises, financial institutions, consulting firms, and anyone and everybody had anything to do with the financial system and agriculture. And that helped generate a lot of interest and, and generate a lot of these relationships that um, are now um, uh, still in play on a commercial basis uh, after the program has concluded. We got a question from Adam, uh, USAID, um, uh, talking about the World Bank Spring meetings and the comments about engaging uh, untapped capital held by <laughs> institutional investors. Um, yeah, absolutely. Capital is capital. Uh, institutional investors need to put that capital uh, out in investments. Uh, of course, institutional investors such as pension funds, insurance companies are are limited in terms of the. Uh, 
uh, basically the the quality of the um, investments that they make or the or the loans that they make. But absolutely, we definitely uh, that those are huge pools of capital, and to the extent possible, yes, definitely want to to tap into that. And the Kenya Mission is very aware. Uh, of that and working that uh, that challenge. Yeah, already in the Kenya Investment uh, Mechanism Program, we are uh, trying to figure out what sort of policy or uh, regulatory constraints exist. But that is one of the uh, mission interests. How can we utilize pension uh, capital uh, to be uh, placed into these uh, productive uh, sectors? Uh, from Ashley, this looks like an interesting systems-based approach. Yes, it's intended to be. Uh, what is the role of the platform after the investment is made? Um, the uh, our hope um, is that uh, uh, in places such as Haiti, uh, that uh, there will be some sort of a uh, could be potentially some sort of a legacy entity. Uh, certainly, this is, will be building the skills uh, of the uh, finance uh, transaction advisors to um, build their capacity to structure more complex transactions. Uh, so we're building the capacity within the financial services industry. And uh, as Ghana has demonstrated, uh, they have strongly built the capacity of the transaction advisors, the BAS providers, to uh, to go out there and um, do this of themselves, to, to originate transactions of themselves. Santiago. You know, there are a number of ways in which sustainability happens. Um, so in Ecuador, very interestingly, one of the business advisory, one of the consulting firms that we engaged um, actually became acquired by one of the financial institutions to become its own SME department. Uh, this was the major bank in uh, in Ecuador. It was uh, Banco Pichincha. They liked so much what these uh, these set of consultants were doing. So that is a way in which uh, the the work that we are doing has uh, has uh, has has stayed in Ghana. To to answer your your very specific question about the network remaining, what's happened in Ghana is that the um, the BDS, the consulting firms have found that talking to each other and inviting um, the SMEs and inviting the financial institutions to, uh, to uh, speak with them on an ongoing basis is so uh, important to them that they develop their, their network and uh, they've maintained this network where a lot of this information exchange is taking place. So the next one from Brian, is there a problem with collusion? Oh, that's a good question between um, between the consulting firms and FIs. If uh, consulting firms are incentivized for successful transactions, I would worry about a collusion with some local bank officials to make bad loans and then split the incentive. Good question, uh, and I can uh, answer that very directly. So that's our role. Part of the role of the of, of, uh, of the implementing partner is to make sure that none of that funny stuff happens. But also, the structure of the program makes it difficult. At the end of the day, uh, these banks are using their own capital. Uh, we're only giving them a bit of an incentive uh, for fee. Where the collusion could take place, uh, and we also are taking steps uh, or take steps uh, for it not to not to happen, is whether uh, a uh, an SME uh, might give the job of putting together a uh, business plan to their cousin or to their uh, nephew or to a friend, and you know have them uh, collect a, a fee. And that is where the due diligence that we do early on um, comes into play. That is where um, we only work with those who have actually applied formally. And we actually do a formal assessment on whether this is a, a good consulting firm that we want to be involved with. And so that really cuts down on uh, any of that. And that has not been one of the issues that we've dealt with in, uh, in the way in which we have operationalized these programs. I want to make a further comment, uh, comment on this. 
um, this type of an approach could be subject to these types of problems. But this is actually one area where the USAID rules on who you subcontract and who you provide grants to really helps mitigate some of those issues. And, um, and that is where uh, our grants manuals or subcontracting manuals really come in handy and, um, and we keep a good eye on that. Um, I would say keep in mind that we are using incentives here. Anytime basically you're using incentives, um, people are going to try and get those incentives. I'd say that we've tried to minimize the incentives, so we're not concerned uh, that uh, 100, 200, 300 basis points is enough of a difference uh, to really shape a financial institution's decision and make a bad loan, uh, you know, just to get that. That's not going to happen. We've done the studies, and actually loans that have been part of our programs have had uh, better performance rates than uh, other loans in the general uh, financial system. And just a thought on that. Again, we do want to get the party started with incentives. No question. Uh, that, I think, uh, one of the surprises of Ghana is the banks uh, initially were really, really enthusiastic about it because they'd never seen this before. Um, so I think uh, one can afford to be generous in the incentives. In terms of setting the incentives, uh, I think the challenge is really how do you sort of minimize the uh, again, the incentive to the amount needed to get the transaction done so you're not overpaying. In Ghana, uh, they did a sort of quasi-auction process in which they went out to the, uh, the, the institutions and said, what would you need in terms of incentive payments to make these types of transactions, and then developed a pool at the lower end. But you can be fairly flexible uh, in that, so the pool doesn't have to last. Basically, the rate doesn't have to last for five years. It can be available for six months, and the rate right thereafter changes there. So, um, okay, uh, FinTech from Indra again. To what degree has FinTech been included in the financing process? Again, what we're trying to develop here is to get the market actors to uh, um, basically get, uh, you know, to, to make this work. A smart BAS provider? Absolutely. Uh, they're going to set up a, a, a FinTech system and hopefully get in loads of transactions and hopefully make a lot of money. Um, that would be terrific. Yeah, we've had some visibility. So when in, uh, in Ghana, essentially uh, the RFP process for the financial institutions where we're asking them, what are you going to do with the incentives that you collect from our program? Um, several of them were going to utilize them to uh, include uh, fintech into their um, into their systems and so um, that has been uh, one of the things that uh, we haven't necessarily uh, targeted to do but the, the market has asked for uh, just got time for a couple more one from the IC university <coughs> program uh, what are the plans to create uh, leave behind a local entity or digital tools to ensure sustainability one of the things I'm really hopeful about in one of the countries we're working in is that this provides a unique platform. Let's say for some national who's uh, working in, um, you know, New York, an investment bank, to say, you know, I'm interested in coming down to uh, this country and setting up shop, and I think I can make some money uh, doing it. And with that, basically creating essentially some sort of a, a merchant bank or an entity if nothing else, we will have created a platform which will attract, give people a, basically a, a basis from which they can uh, do their, their transaction structuring uh, skills and hopefully turn it into a legacy uh, operation. We have a question from Benin about the micro-entrepreneur ecosystem. I think I answered it uh, in... Uh, in explaining how we work with microfinance institutions and how they themselves then on lend to microentrepreneurs. Um, then we have a question, and, and I'll, I'm going to mention it because this is important. Uh, someone interested in a pricing model developed for a specific institution, which I'm now going to share because that is part of the uh, confidentiality that we need to have with some of these financial institutions as to what they're going to do with the resources. But 
what we do with this one particular institution is similar to what we're doing with other institutions, and USAID uh, has access to all that information. Um, let's see. We have a last uh, good question. In Kenya, uh, let's see, from Anna, previous interventions to enhance uh, financial inclusion uh, have not worked because uh, basically the concept of fund guarantees, uh, they did not get financing to the concept of fund guarantees. Um, partial guarantees can be a useful tool, um, absolutely. This takes a different approach uh, and uh, offers another element uh, beyond financial guarantees, which may be interesting. <coughs> um, I think the question, actually, I would say is uh, we know that incentives work, right? So what happens when the incentives end? Basically, does the program end? No, I would make the argument that when we are using blended capital incentives, what we're really doing is allowing these institutions to explore the viability of this, uh, of this market segment uh, and, to some extent, covering their cost of entry uh, 